Yes, guys. So let's start with a new topic: valuations. When you're talking about valuation, the first thing that you need to understand is there's no debits, no credits. We're just valuing the business. We're, val we're just valuing the shares and the goodwill. Whenever I'm talking about this topic, I can split this topic into valuation of goodwill. Valuation of intangibles or brand valuation you can call this. Valuation of a share and valuation of business. Broad classification of our valuation chapter is these four. Now, First, to identify your valuation of a share in a business, the first thing that we need to know is valuation of goodwill as well as valuation of intangibles. Now, valuation of goodwill is not a very new topic to us. We have always seen valuation of goodwill as a part of partnership accounts. Whenever there is a restructuring of a partnership accounts like admission, change in profit sharing ratio, retirement, debt, be it whatever case, we came up with valuation of goodwill and a portion of goodwill has to be contributed by the new partner or it should be given up to the uh, you know de deceased partner or the retiring partner. Now the same logic of our valuation of goodwill will go on. Now first of all to understand this topic of valuation of goodwill let's first understand what is this word goodwill. Now goodwill can be called as reputation of a firm, that firm, this firm, everything whenever we talk about that is an economic definition. When I'm coming to the accounting definition for it I'll call it as future excess earning capacity this is a broad definition as far as goodwill which we can give when we are using for our accounting purpose now future excess earning capacity now whenever I'm using the word excess earning Excess over what? It is excess over normal earnings. In a sense, if I invest 100 rupees of a capital and I earn 15 rupees of a profit, any other person in the same industry would have used that 100 rupees to earn 12 rupees of a profit. I earn 15, so I am earning 3 rupees excess profit. That is the meaning of the word excess earnings. Now, whenever we are talking about goodwill, the first thing that you need to understand is we are talking about future. We are not talking about what has already happened. We are trying to estimate what will be, ha will be happening as far as the future is concerned. Past profits. And this taking a basis of the past profits to identify what my future profits is called as extrapolation of past profits. Extrapolation into future. Now what does this extrapolation means? It's a simple thing. Let's try to plot it on a graph. If I have a graph with an x-axis and a y-axis, having x-axis as number of years, and y axis as your profits and if I split the graph into two parts this is a past and this is future if I plot my past profits on a particular line in a graph this way then what he says is extrapolation into future my future profits should follow the same trend now this is what we do. So to estimate my future profit, this is what I mean. I am taking into account my past profits. I will take the past profits into account and I am trying to find out what could be my future profits tomorrow. Now this is called as extrapolation of profits. So though valuation of goodwill is talking about future profits, we consider our past profits into consideration. We will take our past profits into consideration to identify what could be our future profits. Now. 
to take this as a basis of past profits how is the past profits taken as a basis and what could be the future additions everything should be considered one by one now before we get into the core concepts of future profits let's try to understand let's say two people have started a business let's say they have started in the same location same industry with the same amount of capital one person continued the activity let's say they have started with a stationary business a stationary business selling all the stationary items like books pens pads and everything let's say one person has continued the business at least working 9 hours in a day and has come up with a capital of 1 lakh earning a profit of 28000 with a capital of 1 lakh let's say if this was the situation i have one more person mr b who used the same capital but he did not continue the business these were called as trading profits what he received in the course of trade in the day of day to day business but let's say b instead of actually taking the trading profits he invested this one lakh out of this at least 80000 he has invested in some securities 20000 only in the business now all in all put together he says that i got 32000 of profit out of this 32000 of profit i'll split up and i'll say that 4000 were only your 6000 were only my trading profits and the balance 26000 were received as from the profit on securities be it let's say in the form of interest or dividend or from the sale of securities he earned 26000 profit now when i'm trying to value the business goodwill the goodwill of that particular business the first thing you need to understand you cannot say that b has an excess profits of 4000 not possible the simple logical reason is because he does he did not earn a majority of the profits from trade the majority of the profit has been earned from securities these type of profits what are earned in the form of securities other than in the form of business these are called as non trade investment income income which is received other than from the trading activities this is called as non trade investment income now if you try to assess the goodwill of a and b let's say b wanted to assess his goodwill he can't come up with a you know say uh, with a statement saying that i am earning excess profits over a the simple reason is because b did not conduct the activities of the trade on a proper basis he invested only a po portion of the capital into your trading activities balance of the capital was taken to some other activities so what we can say is only a enjoys goodwill b does not enjoy the share of goodwill because his trading activities are very low so first thing that you need to understand is this non trade investment income cannot be considered in valuation of goodwill this is the first point that we need to pick up non trade investment income cannot be taken into consideration for the valuation of goodwill in the similar way the amount invested into this non trade investments also cannot be considered as capital invested because when i'm talking about capital employed such capital employed is only talking about the capital that you invested in your trading activities whatever capital went into the non trade activities cannot be considered as capital employed for the purpose of valuation of goodwill on a similar situation let's say the capital was employed properly everything going on properly but let's say there was a strike in the organization so what happens when i'm looking at my past profits it doesn't look this way my past profits have been plotted and i'm seeing the graph this way there's a dip in the graph and this dip in the graph was basically because of some abnormal event let's say there was a tsunami earthquake or you talk about any particular activity like a strike you have a dip in the profits can i consider this dip as a you know as a basis for extrapolating into future not possible 
The simple reason is because such an events are called as extraordinary events. Now, extraordinary events need not give you only a loss. There could be an extraordinary event which might result even in a future. Let's say this fellow has went and purchased some lottery ticket and the lottery ticket has got the prize money. So what happens? Automatically your profit increases. Now such an extraordinary income if you are taking into consideration, you are trying to increase your future profits beyond your, new, your normal profits. So one more very important statement to make is extraordinary items. Either it could be extraordinary income or extraordinary losses cannot be considered in valuation of goodwill. To sum up, what we say is Goodwill is not based on future profits. Goodwill is not just based on future profits. We call this profits as FMP. It simply means we are talking about future maintainable profits. Now when I'm talking about future maintainable profits, understand what profits I can expect to earn as far as the future is concerned. Let's say over the past three years, I am enjoying a contract which was entered into at some advantageous prices. And such an advantageous price is giving me an extra net profit of at least 4 lakhs every year. So 4 lakhs, 4.5 lakhs or 4.6 lakhs like this I have been receiving in the past 3-4 years. But... I am seeing that the contract will be expired by the end of this year and there is no option for renewal of the contract. So what happens when I am trying to extrapolate into the future, I cannot consider this 4 lakhs profit what, has, what I have been earning on a continuous basis over the last 3 years. Though it is my past profits, I will not be considering it for the computation of FMP. The simple logical reason is because he is talking about maintainable profits of future. Now, such a contract which I cannot extend to the future and it is going to lapse at the end of this year, I will not be earning such profit in the future. So, that is the reason why we say that it cannot form part of your future maintainable profits. Similarly, let's say next year I am expecting the rent of the business, rent of the factory premises to go up. Now, whenever the rent of the factory premises is expected to go up, what happens to your net profit? Now, just because there is an extra rent which is paid, I cannot expect to earn an extra income over it. So what happens automatically my profit also comes down. Now on a genuine basis, year on year when I have this situation where the future profits are expected to grow, though I take my past profits into consideration, at the end I will add some trend. So let's say that I am expecting a normal trend of 5% increase in the net profit every year. So that can be taken as a consideration. So whenever I am talking about future maintainable profits, I need to consider an adjustment for the past profits First thing, for all those profits which are not expected to recur, all non-recurring profits and all non-recurring losses. Non-recurring losses could be like your strike loss, your earthquake loss, a loss due to fire. All these are non-recurring. You can't expect a fire accident to occur every year in your factory, which could be an extraordinary exception. So such exceptions I'm not considering. So when I'm talking about future maintainable profits, I'm taking into consideration only those profits which are expected to recur Again, in the future years also, there could be some adjustments for a proposed increase in the factory rent, proposed increase in the salaries. Also, there could be some growth element in your profits or there could be an increase in the selling price which could also increase your profits. But provided whenever you are trying to increase your selling price, you need to also look at the demand. You can also look at the demand because we very popularly know in economics that once your price increases, automatically your demand starts falling down. So keeping a demand constant and then if you are increasing the prices then I can expect that the future profits will be more. But if you are making a contrary assumption saying that you know there will be an increase in the future pro future selling price but there will be an increase in the demand so they both get set off. Future profits cannot be considered to be on an extraordinary level. Got it? So this is our basic introduction to the chapter where we start with future maintainable profits. Future maintainable profits, whenever we are trying to calculate, 
the first thing we need to take the past profits into consideration and taking the past profits into consideration we also have to take up this adjustment where the non-trade profits whatever are earned in the past cannot be taken for the purpose of FMP. The second thing extraordinary incomes and losses extraordinary gain extraordinary losses cannot be considered for future maintainable profits because these extraordinary items are non-recurring events. These extraordinary incomes and losses are also be called as non-recurring items. I am not expecting them to recur in the future. So I am not able to, I'm, I will not be able to consider it for the computation of my future maintainable profits. So this is where we start with. From here we will talk about how FMP is used for the valuation of goodwill.
so let's get into the main concept guys let's try to understand what are the determinants of goodwill three core determinants of goodwill goodwill is based on three figures the first one is your FMP that is your future maintainable profits the second one is your capital employed and the final one is your NRR NRR is nothing but normal rate of return FMP is your future maintainable profits, second one is a capital employed and the third one is NRR, normal rate of return. First one, let's try to understand how do we calculate this FMP. Future maintainable profits, to get my future profits, I told you to get the future profits, we need to take the basis of past profits. So for identifying the future maintainable profits, the first thing that we need to do is consider past profits. How do we consider the past profits? We take an average of the past profits. We take an average of the past profits. Now whenever I am talking about an average of past profits, such an average of my past profits, I can split it into two parts. One is called as a simple average. The other one is called as a weighted average. Simple average is simple arithmetic mean, add all the profits divided by number of years. But weighted average profits, I need to add the profits with multiply the profits with the weights. Now, whenever I'm talking about simple profits or simple average, then I'm talking about sum of all profits divided by number of years. So I have three years, so add three years profits divided by three. Weighted average profits, sum of profits into weight divided by sum of weights sum of profit into weight divided by sum of weights will give you weighted average profits now whenever you are assigning weights always remember my weights assignment should be highest weight to the most recent year and the least weight to the earliest year. In the sense, let's say I have profits of, let's say we are standing today in 2015 and we are trying to analyze what could be our future maintainable profits. So I've considered my past profits starting from 2012. I took 2012, 2013 and 2014 into consideration. Then he is saying that the highest weight should be given to the recent year. So standing in 2015, what is your most recent year? 2014. So the highest weight should be given to 2014 and the earliest year is 2012 which will be given the least weight. So if you are normally assigning weights as 1, 2 and 3, then 2012 will be 1, 2013 will be 2 and 2014 will be 3. The highest weight should be given to the most recent year. Now the question arises, when should I adopt a simple average? When should I adopt a weighted average? My weighted average will be adopted when the past profits are in an increasing or decreasing trend.
in this situation definitely what we'll try to do is we'll be taking a weighted average so i need an increasing trend or a decreasing trend either of these two trends for me to adopt a weighted average of profits but whenever i do not have such trend when no trend in future in the past profits we follow a simple average now whenever i am talking about an increasing or a decreasing trend let's say i have profits of 15 30 and 31 is it an increasing trend yes you cannot just compare saying that 15 to 30 there's a 100% increase but 30 to 31 there's only 1 by 30 increase there's no situations like that an increasing trend is irrespective of the slope slope in the sense what is the difference between two profits irrespective of the difference between two profits if they are in an increasing trend that is sufficient for me to say that we can take a weighted average of the profits this is regarding average regarding the past profits like we have already concluded just saying that you cannot consider non trade investment income at the same time you cannot consider your extraordinary income well there are other things also which we need to consider as far as your past profits are concerned so when we are talking about our past profits the first exclusion from the past profits is exclude non trade incomes a general non trade income is your interest on investments can an interest on investment become a trade investment trade income yes if it is an investment company definitely it is a trade in trade income sometimes to give a bank guarantee or a, to give a letter of credit you need to give a deposit to the bank some fixed deposit i have made with the bank to give a guarantee such fixed deposit is giving me return it becomes a trading profit extraordinary situations but normally what we take is non trade investment income is always a exclusion from the past profits also exclude all the extraordinary gains and losses simple reason is because these are non recurring in nature they are not expected to recur in future so i'll take it as an exclusion past profits whenever we are considering for computation of future prof future maintainable profits fmp is always post tax after payment of tax so when you are valuing fmp i need to always consider post tax and such a tax rate is always future effective tax rate not the tax rate of the past i need to consider the future effective tax rate till last year i have been paying tax at 33% but from the future year i need to pay tax only at 25% so i need to consider 25% in computing your fmp as post tax i should not consider the past year for tax rate it's a future effective tax rate that we need to consider in computation of fmp but always fmp is post tax when we are calculating goodwill we are calculating goodwill for the business a goodwill for the owners so on the basis of owners funds we are calculating owners are also paid in the form of dividend 
Now, should I deduct the dividend from the past profits? Absolutely no. Because you yourself are calculating it for the owners, I cannot deduct the amount of dividend paid. So, do not deduct. Dividend to either equity or preference shareholders. Dividend paid or dividend proposed should not be deducted in computation of your goodwill. Now, whenever we are talking about the past profits and we considered all the past profits taking an average excluding few things, what we need to also consider is growth segment. There could be some future increase in the profits or future decrease in the profits due to some particular reasons. So, future adjustment to profits. When we are talking about future adjustment to profits, it can either be increase in increase in selling price without effect on demand or Future expected increase in expenses. There can be an increase in the expenses like operating expenses. Or wages. Or future increase in material cost. Raw material cost also can increase. That will also seriously affect your future profits. Growth or decline given as a form of percentage. I am expecting that the profits will decline by 5% or increase by 5% in the future. Advantage from future contracts. I've got a future contract for the next four years, which will be going to give me a profit, an extra increase in the profit by 3 lakhs every year. Increase in expenditure can be anything. Any particular increase in expenditure will decrease my past profits. Sorry, will decrease my future maintainable profits. These are adjustments to be given to past profits after taking an average. We cannot restrict it to these adjustments guys. There could be some other adjustments which will be given in the question. We need to understand what is its impact on the future profits and give it accordingly.
Let's talk about the second determinant that is your capital employed. What do you understand by this word capital employed? Capital employed simply means assets minus outside liabilities. Or we can also call it as equity share capital plus reserves. Assets always considered at their realizable values and liabilities always considered at their settlement values. Assets considered at realizable values and liabilities considered at settlement values. That will give you your capital employee. Now, whenever we are trying to understand our capital employee, my adjustments to this is first one. Here the first exclusion was non-trade income. So the investment which is earning me that non-trade income should be excluded here. So exclude non-trade investments. Exclude your non-trade investments. I have excluded non-trade ex investment income in your FMP. I am excluding non-trade investments for computation of capital employed. I am valuing goodwill. So I need to exclude goodwill. I cannot take goodwill as a part of capital, uh, capital employed when you are trying to value goodwill itself. So your assets exclude these two items. What about liabilities? Proposed dividend is not an outside liability. It's a liability to my own members. I cannot consider it as a part of outside liability at all. My assets exclude non-trade investment and goodwill. My liabilities exclude proposed dividend. What about provision for tax? Provision for tax is an outside liability because government cannot be considered as a owner of the company. So government is an outside party. So provision for tax compulsorily exclude. Employee liabilities like employee provision fund, bonus, everything is an exclusion as far as your capital employed is concerned. So these are what we need to consider as an adjustment from your capital employed when we are talking about capital employed for the purpose of valuation of goodwill what we use is not capital employed what we use is average capital employed Guys, when I'm talking about the word average capital employee, it simply means it is opening capital employee plus closing capital employee 
divided by 2. Simple logic. So we need to calculate what is your capital employed based on these rules what we have framed. We need to understand at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year. Divided by 2, you will get average capital employed. The same formula can also be rewritten in two different ways. The first way to write it is opening capital employed plus half of current year profit after tax. Or I can also write it as closing capital employed minus half of current year's profit after tax. Current year profit after tax is the adjustment there. Now there is no new thing that we are framing from this. Normally he is going by the rule that my closing capital employed is equal to opening capital employed plus current year profit after tax. I am using this myth. Now if you want to place it in your closing capital employed, see how it forms. My average capital employed is equal to opening capital employed plus closing capital employed divided by 2. If I place this formula into closing capital employed, then opening capital employed plus opening capital employed plus current year profits or I can say two opening capital employed plus current year profit after tax divided by two or the same thing can be written as opening capital employed plus half of current year profit after tax. This is the formula that we derived. So is the opening formula rewritten in this way? Now in the same way, if I write opening capital employed is equal to closing minus current year profits, then and if you apply it in the rule, then you will get closing capital employed minus half of current year profits. So basically this is your formula, but we are rewriting this formula in two different ways. The maximum cases what we will be using is this formula. In maximum cases to calculate your average capital employed, what we'll use is closing capital employed minus half of current year profits. It's just the way to derive your you know, the other two formulas guys and nothing else. Just for your understanding. There are actually five things that we need to talk about. Two things I parked it aside. Because you need to have a clear understanding of those two. Fictitious assets. What are fictitious assets? Miscellaneous expenses not written off in the balance sheet. Now such expenditure or such an asset which is appearing on the asset side of the balance sheet, shall, can I consider it for the purpose of computation of capital employed? The answer is, your fictitious assets, what did we say? Assets at realizable values. What is the realizable value of a fictitious asset? 
if i sell loss on sale of loss on issue of debentures or discount on issue of preferences will anyone buy that underwriting commission underwriting commission we have already paid we did not take it to pnl yet we are trying to amortize it over 5 years so any expenditure like that they are called as a fictitious asset such fictitious asset is nothing but miscellaneous expenses which are not written off such items i do not have realizable values so normally we say for a fictitious asset your realizable value is zero fictitious asset the realizable value is zero next one is preference share capital is it an outside liability for the purpose of computation of goodwill preference shareholders are also owners of the business so whenever i'm calling him as a owner i cannot consider him as a outside liability preference share capital is not an outside liability even if i have cumulative preference shares the arrears of preference dividend is also not an outside liability what is your normal rate of return nrr we have seen a plenty of goodwill calculations where we normally are already given our nrr but here there will be few situations where nrr is not given to us it is our responsibility to calculate nrr but before that to have an understanding of the normal rate of return nrr we can say that it is always industry specific i cannot have the same nrr for a steel industry and i cannot have the same nrr as for a let's say any software segment is concerned you cannot have the same nrr now in a basic framework i can talk about saying that pharmaceutical companies they have higher nrr because their major expenditure is research and development not the manufacturer of the medicine manufacturer of the medicine is 1 rupee but he will be charging you at least 10 rupees or 15 rupees for the particular medicine because he is not relating it to the cost of the medicine manufacture i have to relate it to the research and development expenditure which i incurred in getting that medicine out so normally you see pharmaceutical companies enjoying a higher nrr than the other companies one more thing understand the risk is also very high because the research and development expenditure can either be a failure or can be a you know a success there so they normally take a higher share of nrr software segment normally higher share of nrr because whenever you talk about any service industry the maximum cases you will find you will find a higher nrr there but whenever you talk about a manufacturing segment you find a very low nrr you can even take the case of your income tax also income tax says if you are doing any trading business or any manufacturing business your general you know presumptive taxation rate is 8% that is normally considered to be on a average side 
average is 8. We normally see situations which are much lower than that. Then how are these people even surviving in that industry? Because of the volume. You cannot have the same volume in any other segment. Manufacturing segment can produce a highest amount of volumes. Even that 8% or 6% looks huge when you consider those volumes. So whenever I am talking about NRR, it is always industry specific. Now, to that we will restrict as far as the problems are concerned. But normal or general understanding of NRR, NRR is not just industry specific, it is also, it is also specific to the geography as well. Geographical location also determines your NRR. An Idli Sambar zone in South India is not the same NRR have in the same in your North India, North India or any other part of the world. In the same way, a lungi which can be sold in Chennai cannot have the same NRR if it is sold in any other part of the country. A woolen cloth which is sold in any other part of the country has not the same NRR in India. So geographical locations also determine your NRR because of the personal choices as well as the geographical conditions. Normally when you have cold climates, people tend to buy a lot of woolen cloth. Now, whenever you are selling those high woolen, thick woolen clothing as far as South India is concerned not possible but whenever you talk about North India major, majority of the you know, states there at least have 3 to 4 months of peak winter so they can go for a very thick woolen clothing so though we say that you know NRR or is industry specific someone who is dealing with the textiles will always have the same NRR it cannot be taken as the same case the case is completely different Got it? So always whenever we are talking about problem, let's put it here that it is industry specific, leave it there. But actually it depends on plenty of other factors as well. Now how to calculate an NRR when the NRR is not given to us? To find this, we have two methods. The first one is called as dividend yield method. My dividend yield method in computation of NRR is NRR is equal to average dividend per share divided by market price per share into 100. What is your dividend payout divided by your market price into 100 is a normal NRR for a dividend yield method. Or you can also have an earnings yield method where NRR can be considered as average EPS by market price per share into 100. Which formula to use will be based on the data which is given in the question. If I am given average earnings, I will take earnings yield method. If I am given average dividend, then I can take dividend yield method. So, NRR for all the companies within the same industries is same. Absolutely wrong. NRR is basically can calculated for the industry, but at the same time, we need to adjust it for each company. How do we adjust the NRR for each company? Always there is a plus or minus that can be used. Whenever you have a higher risk, you expect a higher return. 
So a company which has a higher risk will be expecting a higher NR. A company which has a lower risk within the same industry will be expecting a lower NR. Whenever you are talking about NRR, always think from the shareholder's perspective. Let's say debt funds in a company are much more than the industrial average. Industrial average debt equity ratio is let's say about 2 is to 1. But this particular company has 3 is to 1 debt equity ratio. Now, <clears throat> think about its bearing on the NRR. Think from the shareholder's perspective. The first thing, when there are higher debt funds, there is a higher portion of interest, interest to be paid. Whenever I am paying higher amount of interest, the profit available to the equity shareholder obviously falls. Second bearing. Whenever I have a higher debt funds at the time of liquidation of a company, normally the debt funds paid are paid first and then comes your shareholder funds. So the amount which will be left out towards the equity shareholders are always a residual cash and which is tend to reduce if there are higher debt funds. So think from the equity shareholders perspective. Shareholder is suffering a higher risk because of higher debt funds. So whenever I come, uh, I come to this conclusion, they will be expecting a higher NRR because they are suffering a higher risk. So though I have two companies within the same industry, if one company has a higher debt funds than the equity funds, then I can say that the company which has a higher debt funds has slightly higher NRR. How much slightly higher NRR? 1%, 0.5%. 2%, 5%, that is completely your assumption. To that extent, as far as the problems are concerned, there will not be given exactly how much is the percentage increase in the NRR to be given. Well, we come up to a conclusion saying that the NRR should be higher. That's it. Now, let's say the NRR of the industry we have calculated using the earnings yield method as 14. But he has given you additional conditions saying that there is a debt equity ratio which is not favorable for the equity shareholders in the particular company to whom you are valuing the goodwill. So what happens when there is an unfavorable debt equity ratio, I am expecting a higher NRR. Now 14 plus something, 14 plus what? 14 plus, there should be some percentage which should be added. Now that how much percentage to be added is left out to the student. Now the student can make any particular assumption saying that the risk premium can be 1%, the risk premium is 0.5% or any particular rate. No problem. So, will the answers be same? No. Answers can't be same whenever you are taking different NRR ratios. So, whenever you are talking about problem regarding your NRR, I will leave it to you. But normally what we will take is, we will try to bring it to a particular percentage. Let's say I have 13 and I have a risk premium to be added. I will normally add 2%. So, that it comes down to 15%. My calculations become much simpler. I know you still use a calculator. But let's try to get it on a normal scale not comfortable you can take any other percentage to be added you can add 0.5 you can add 1 you can add 2 but don't try to add 10 percent or 15 percent which are not realistic so your nrr could be something close to your industrial nrr one unfavorable condition then probably a 0.5 percent or a 1 percent can be added not beyond that don't go in an extraordinary situations always now is this the only case for nrr no Sometimes, I don't know how many of you know, there is a capital gearing ratio which can be even considered. There is also an interest coverage ratio. Now, interest, fixed interest and dividend coverage ratio also determines your NR. Now, all these taken into consideration. First of all, you need to know what is the industrial average. Then, identify this company's average and try to compare. If there is a favorable situation, my NRR is lower. If there is an unfavorable situation, NRR is higher. Think from the shareholder's perspective, whether it is a favorable ratio or unfavorable ratio. Unfavorable, higher risk. Higher risk, higher return. Favorable ratio, lower risk, lower return. So, these two are very, very important conditions to be considered. Got it? So, those adjustments to NRR will see it specific to any particular problem because the problem should give you what is the industrial average. Without giving you the industrial average, I cannot assume saying that the debt equity ratio is high. High with compared to what? You have 3 is to 1 debt equity ratio. If the industry is specific, you know, industry is average itself is 3 is to 1, then I cannot keep adding. So they should give you what is the industrial average. Then you identify for this particular company and the question for whom you are valuing the goodwill. Then try to understand whether it is a risk premium to be added or a risk dilution that happens. So those are industry specific donations that we will see whenever the problem arises. 
as of now only have in mind that industrial average NRR needs to be adjusted. Adjusted for either a risk premium or a risk dilution. Now a risk is called to be a premium when I have an unfavorable ratio. Whenever I have a favorable ratio there is a dilution in the risk. That is a simple understanding as far as the NRR is concerned. So we have seen three determinants for computation of goodwill. One was the FMP, next one was capital employed and last one was NRR. Using three determinants we have computation of goodwill. Now before we go into the computation of goodwill radius methods, I don't think so the methods are anything new to us that we are seeing only as a part of this topic. We have seen valuation of goodwill by average profits method, by super profits method, by annuity method and also our capitalization method. The same four methods I will use here. But let us try to understand how did they, get, they come up with these four methods, different methods for valuation of goodwill. Uh, for this you need to understand that in your economics as far as the definitions were concerned, first Adam Smith the father of economics gave a definition. Then Alfred Marshall comes in and says that you know there are certain flaws as far as the definition was given. So he comes up with a new definition. Again Lionel Robbins will come and says that you know Alfred Marshall's definition also has flaws. He will start building on that. Now always whenever you have a new method it is a development over the previous method. So there is some flaw as far as the previous method is concerned. That is the reason why you always get a new method into consideration. So when we have four methods we need to consider what are the flaws in each method and try to build up on those flaws to get all the four methods. The first and the basic method that was calculated for that was used in valuation of goodwill was your average profits method. Let's start with that. Methods of valuation of goodwill. Let's talk about this. The first method that I'll be discussing is average profits method. Under average profits method, the value of goodwill is equal to future maintainable profits multiplied by number of years purchase. We have already seen computation of future maintainable profits. So the same future maintainable profits multiplied by number of years purchase. Now what do you understand by this term number of years purchase? Number of years purchase means the number of years The business is expected to sustain its goodwill. Or today, if I am saying that I have a better share in the market and I am enjoying some goodwill as far as the market is concerned. Now I need to also expect how long you are, you are going to hold such a superior position as far as the market is concerned. Now you need to understand at some point of time there will be a competitor which will be coming up and will be challenging your position in the market. So I cannot expect this as infinity. This can't be expected as infinity for the purpose of valuation of goodwill. Maximum number of years purchase can be considered as 5. Reasonable assumption should be limited to 5 years. Virtually certain assumptions can be taken up to 7 years which is a irrelevant concept as of now.
highly competitive markets normally the value number of years purchase is lower highly competitive markets you tend to find it less lower now if facebook starts valuing its goodwill five years is basically a joke because it will be much much higher than that there hasn't been a competitor who has been challenging his position since last five to ten years so definitely you will find this to be much higher at that point of time but whenever you are talking about let's say an automobile segment hyundai honda tota Tata, Toyota, Mahindra, you take any particular company, you can't take 5 years. Because basically it's rapidly changing market. A rapidly changing market that to huge competition, this figure tends to be quite lower. Retail segments normally lower. Retail segment always lower. You talk about any clothing brand, you can't expect that a particular clothing brand is going to sustain its market share for a very huge point of time. Not possible because it completely keeps changing on the trend. Yearly itself, we have at least four trends in clothing which keeps changing. So you need to understand that if someone is not really updated as far as their, you know, their trends are concerned, they normally tend to fall this. So this figure normally is given to us in the question. You don't have to make an assumption regarding how many years this company is going to sustain the future profits. No, no such assumptions to be made. This question, the question will always contain this. Now the first thing that I'll come up with is. There is some flaw when I am talking about this goodwill valuation. What is a flaw in this method? If you remember the goodwill method or the goodwill definition which I have given as far as account is accounting is concerned. We use the term future excess earning capacity. What is future maintainable profits? Future earnings. Number of years purchase. My capacity to sustain the future earnings. So basically if you observe, he skipped one term in the definition. One term in the definition itself is skipped. The word excess. He did not use the word excess. Future profits or future earnings capacity. But the actual definition is future excess earning capacity. That word excess is completely skipped. I never compared it with any normal average. So what we'll start doing now is we'll start developing a new method. That is a super profit method. Which will try to fix the flaw. Let's try to fix the flaw. So goodwill is equal to. Instead of FMP. What do we have to consider now? Super profits. Because we are trying, trying to find out. What is excess earnings? <coughs> excess earnings is nothing but. Super profits. Super profit into number of years purchase. Your number of years purchase is the same. I am not changing that. Uh, how do we calculate this super profit now? Super profit is nothing but future maintainable profits. Excess. Excess I need to calculate. My future profits in excess of normal profits. So whenever I am talking about normal profits, how do we identify normal profits? Normal profits in a sense, with the given capital what I have, I earn this much of profits. That is FMP. Any other person, how much he would have earned is normal profits. To identify normal profits, it is NRR, normal rate of return as a percentage multiplied on average capital employed. NRR as a percentage multiplied on average capital employed. We have seen NRR and we have also seen average capital employed. These were your three basic determinants. FMP, NRR, average capital employed. Now, even this method is expected to be flawed. Now, what is a flaw as far as this method is concerned? What is this number of years purchase? 
number of years for which the business is expected to sustain such goodwill. So I am trying to talk about future. This profit which I am trying to compare is also of future. So whenever I am talking about future, I am standing on today, 2015 and I am trying to assess what will be my future earnings. So whenever I am talking about my future earnings, understand standing today, we need to start discounting them to present value. So the logic here is, he did not take present value in discussing about the number of years purchase. I am just taking it as a normal figure. The undiscounted basis we have calculated. So to fix this up, we will start taking a discounted basis. And such discounted basis, we call it as annuity method of computation. Annuity method in valuation of goodwill. Goodwill is equal to FMP is fine. Oh sorry, super profit is fine. But instead of taking number of years purchase, I need to start taking a discounted factor. Such discounted factor is called as present value annuity factors. Discount rate given as 10% and if my number of years purchase is 3 years, then it should be 1.1. Sorry, 1 divided by 1.1 power 3. That is your PVAF, present value annuity factors. So I'll take a present value annuity factor instead of number of years purchase. Well, I won't call it as a development for the fourth method. But if suppose the number of years purchase is not given to you in the question, then don't try to make assumptions. When the number of years purchase is not given, we use another method called as capitalization method. This method does not use number of years purchase at all. How do we calculate goodwill as per capitalization method? We say that goodwill is equal to normal capital employed minus average capital employed. This was our determinant of goodwill, average capital employed. We know how to calculate our average capital employed opening plus closing by two or two other formulas that we have developed from that. What are the inclusions? What are the exclusions? We know this. Well, this is something new. How do we calculate normal capital employed? Normal capital employed can be given as future maintainable profits divided by NRR as percentage. One, two, three, three determinants of goodwill again. I'm not using number of years purchase here. For our simple understanding, I'm saying. If my capital employed is 100 and with this I am expecting a future maintainable profits to be about 27. Let's take a normal figure. I will take it as 25. If I have to calculate super profits then I will keep my FMP and my capital employed as constant. On this capital employed of 100. If I apply normal rate of return, I will get normal profits to be compa compared with FMP. But in capitalization method, I will take FMP as constant. If let's say for this business, NRR is equal to 20%. Let's say this way. If I am following super profits method or annuity method, what do we do? Capital employed multiplied by NRR will give me my normal profits of 20 on comparison with my FMP 5 is my super profit. 
which should be multiplied by either PVF or number of years purchase. But here in our capitalization method, instead of considering this way, I will take 25 constant. Here I did not take 25 constant. Now I am taking 25 as constant. To earn the same 25 rupees at an NRR of 20%, how much capital employed should be invested? That is nothing but 20% return should be equal to 25 rupees. If 20% return is 25, that means the amount to be invested is 125. Then, then compare these two. I will find out my 25 rupees as goodwill. Why is it goodwill? Any other person in the industry normally should have invested 125 to get 25 rupees profit. I am investing 100 rupees and I am getting the same amount of profit. So I am employing 25 rupees less. That 25 rupees what I have invested less is nothing but my value of goodwill. So these are the four basic methods that we need to consider for valuation of goodwill with three very important determinants FMP, capital employed and NRR. The crux of the story lies in how we start valuation of FMP, capital employed and NRR. If you get these valuations right, then there is no chance that you will be going wrong with the method of goodwill valuation.